Welcome to The Net Effect, career conversations and connections. Each episode is devoted to bringing interesting guests who offer insights and perspectives on casting one's net on the right side, as Jesus challenged his apostles to do on the Sea of Galilee. This is The Net Effect, and I am your host, Robin Jones, director of the ABF Career Alliance. Our special guest today is Lamik Katamba. Lamik is from Kampala, Uganda, and he is one of our very own. We are so excited to have him. He is the manager of our Africa programs. Welcome, Lamik. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. This has been so much fun getting to know you and being able to learn about your journey and your incredible work that you do on a day-to-day basis. So, Lamik, tell us a little bit about yourself and where you're from. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. I grew up from a very small village found in Bukuya County in Kasanda District, central Uganda. And this is your village, your house right here, isn't it? Yeah, you're right. That's so fun, Lamek. It um, looks like it's in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. It's kind of like how I grew up um, in a small town, but not a village. So I, I thought we'd start off with this picture. Tell us about this picture, Lamek, and why this is so important to you and, and how it's kind of shaped your future. Well, that is actually my dad. And that little man there is standing with dad is Islamic. So my dad was uh, a farmer. He used to grow coffee and banana, but also used to make local beer for commercial purposes. He used to sell beer, but it, on special days like Christmas and Easter, he used to give away beer for free. So villagers and many other people used to come home to celebrate Christmas or Easter or any other special days. And among the people used to come home were also my teachers from my primary school. So every time they come home and drink and got drunk, they used to beat drums, you know, get happy. And I was the dancer because I used to be a very good dancer. And every time I dance, they used to give money. That was the same money we used to pay for school fees. During that time, that's when the teachers also could give reports, nice reports about me from school, how I used to pass very well, and also how I used to do very good in sports. So the teachers really made my village mates to like me a lot. So I was a kid of the village. Oh, that's so fun. And this is actually the school that you went to when you were a little guy, when you were doing, making those impressive dance moves to all your teachers, right? Yeah, that's my school. It's called Makonzi Church of Uganda Primary School. It was about five kilometers from my home. And I used to just walk to my home. And actually, there was an incident one day. I was walking together with the rest of the kids from the village, walking towards school, and something happened. There was a man who jumped from the forest, and he wanted to grab me. And I ran towards school, but the rest of the kids ran back to the village. I think this man must have thought it was easier to chase after me, who was alone, than chasing the rest of the kids. But what he didn't know is that I was actually the fastest. I used to win a lot of awards and medals for the school because of my fast running. I used to do 100 meters split. So he couldn't catch me. But I remember when I was about to reach school, running, I looked behind and I saw the man who was actually coming very fast. And I was getting tired. Uh, but I realized it was actually the bag, the school bag, which was making me slow down. So I decided to throw away the school bag. And then, yeah, that freed me. And I ran faster until I reached school. 
kids and teachers were surrounding me. Some were actually crying. Uh, I found out later why they were crying. They said when they ran back to the village, they got their parents escorted them to school. And when they were coming, they saw my bag, which I had thrown away. So they thought Lamek had been taken, maybe. So when they saw me late at school, still alive, they were so happy. So it was tears of joy. And so that moment, the teachers decided to move me away from the village. That, that was really an impactful moment and a time in your life, huh? Yeah, because it actually changed everything, because even my grades started improving. As One you, teacher you, offered me where to stay, yeah. and other teachers bought me books. Other teachers, you know, everyone, almost every teacher was contributing something, because, you know, they really liked me, because uh, I used to win for them a lot of awards, and I was a good kid in class. So this helped me a lot. And my, and my teachers promised me that if I ever pass in grade one, they would take me to Kampala, which is the capital city, and I'd never been there. So I worked for that. And indeed, I passed in grade one, which was a history, in the history of the school. It was the first thing for a kid to pass in grade one. So they asked me, do you have any relative in the city? Because they couldn't actually afford the tuition and also accommodation. So I said, yes, I had a sister who was staying in Kampala in a place called Kawempe. And so they brought me to Kawempe, my sister's place. And they took me to pay secondary school. So now I was very happy and excited. What was very interesting is that the walking didn't stop. In the village, I used to make it 10 kilometers a day. And when they brought me to the city, it became almost 16 because I used to make eight kilometers one way and then another eight kilometers back. What was very exciting or what was different is that this time I had shoes. They had gotten me my first pair of shoes. And I was so excited to put on shoes. The only unfortunate part was that the shoes were plastic. <laughs> that they were plastic shoes from China. And every time I would walk in during the day when it is hot, they could almost melt <laughs> and burn my feet. But I never wanted to remove them because I was so excited to put on shoes. How old was, were you when you moved from? The I village? was around. It was coming to fourteen. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I was nervous because these kids in the city were all speaking English. Good mm. English, and I was the only person who didn't know how to speak English. Uh, because in my village, the school there, even the teachers, some teachers didn't know how to speak good English. So they prefer to teach us in, in local language, Luganda. So the thing which helped me a lot was at my new school in the city, they were teaching French. And French was a new language to all the kids, including the Kampala kids. So mm. I knew that all of us were new to French. I decided to concentrate on French and I passed it very well. So that earned me a lot of friends because a lot of my classmates used to come to me for help in French. And also I passed my maths very well. So that also brought me a lot of friends. And yeah, it, it started coming me down a little bit, and I, I got used with it. What religion did you grow up in? What was your faith and your background at that time in your life? In, in my village, I was raised up as an Anglican Protestant. Uh -huh. And yeah, it is very interesting that even when I was a kid, I never really enjoyed being preached at because, you know, sometimes uh, you could meet the priests in the village doing something different from what they were preaching. So that alone made me not enjoy being preached at. When I got a chance to go to the city, mm -hmm. I felt a little bit more free from my parents' protection. And I wanted to explore more. So I started visiting different churches, and some Catholic churches, Pentecostal churches, even in mosques. And mm -hmm. that's how I actually ended up going to the Christian Science Church. 
I found something different in Christian Science Church. And that attracted me a lot. How did you learn about Christian Science? I remember I'd just completed my ordinary level. In Uganda, secondary school is divided into two sections. Mm -hmm. The first four years is called the ordinary level. And then the second two years is called advanced. It's what you call a high school in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So after my ordinary level, I was in a holiday and I decided to escort my friend to go to his uncle to pick school fees. And what I didn't know that his uncle was a Christian scientist. So they were uh, in another room talking about their business. I was uh, remaining alone in the sitting room and I saw these little sentinels. You remember this small pie mm -hmm, sentinels? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. So I took it, I started reading it. And when the uncle came back in the sitting room, I kind of fidgeted, it, put it back because I had not asked for, for permission. But mm -hmm. the gentleman said, oh, don't worry. You can, have, you can have it. If you want more, I can give you more. So he gave me about four sentinels. And I took them home. I read them from cover to cover. And one thing I was realizing, or what I discovered, is that almost all the testimonies in these sentinels, they were all referring to science and health. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what science aids was, so I brought the sentinels back to this gentleman. First of all, I thought they weren't for keeps, so I was returning them after using them. But also I wanted to ask him about science and health, and whether it was a dictionary. So the gentleman was so happy to, to tell me more about science and health, so he brought me a set of books. Now, you remember, I only asked for science and health, but this time you came with a set of books that was science and health and a Bible. And he told me these are the books we use in our church. And if you want, you can actually come and visit our church. I was, of course, very excited. And the following week, I had to go there. I found only three people seated on the hallway. And I thought maybe I was late. So I excused myself. I said, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm late. They said, no, no, no. So they said, okay, can I said to them, can we enter? Where are the rest? They said, we are the only people. And to me, it looked so different. And this, when I said, can we enter? Then they said, no, 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 we are doing it here in the hallway. So there was no room for them. And it was, that's where we did church in the hallway. And they never had any pottery. They used to just open it randomly and read. And I actually thought, that was the way to do the service. Mm -hmm. Until when one visitor, Dr. Nancy Dorsey from the US, came to visit our church and she picked interest in me and she actually disclosed it to me that there was a better way to hold services. She talked to me about many other manual based church activities. So for me, I was now very happy to, to have someone who knew more about Christian science, because originally I was the one trying to study and answer all the questions. I was talking to my friends. I was sharing about Christian science, everything I was discovering and applying and getting results. I was sharing them with my friends and everyone was getting excited and, and interested. And the more they were getting interested in, the more I was yearning to share with them. And remember, what I didn't tell you actually is that I used to be very shy when I was mm. growing up. Right. And this sharing of Christian science or the truth which I was learning actually helped me, helped me to overcome the shyness. Yeah. Well, that's fun. <clears throat> One of the things that strikes me is your willingness to share, but also the lack of fear that, oh, there's only a few people, you know, no big deal. How did, as you began to learn and practice and, and discover, what changed? What was it besides the shyness? And what did you see happening in your life? Well, a lot of things actually changed in my life. First of all, the way I was seeing the world. For example, I remember when I was growing up in my village, in my church, they really never 
talked about healing. I remember when I was growing up in my village and somebody was very sick in my village, that is when they could call in a priest to come and pray for that person to go to heaven if he or she dies. Mm. And no one ever talked about healing or praying for somebody to be healed. And now here I was reading about how people were applying or were praying and getting healed. So to me, that was very unique. Uh, and also, I remember, yeah, I remember when, yeah, I'm trying to remember something. Yes, yes. I discovered that you can actually pray naturally and talk to your God, which was not without a mediator. Unlike where I was raised, every time you had a problem, you had to go to the priest and then pray. They pray, they pray for you. And here, I was doing it myself. And, and also another thing which struck me was the difference between heaven and hell. In my old region, I used to know that uh, heaven is somewhere up there where you can only reach after death. And uh, here in Christian Science, they were talking about heaven and hell right here. You can actually choose to be in heaven or hell right here. So those, those were really so uh, different to me, to, to make me actually make an opinion. But so this, everything I was discovering, I wanted to share it. And it, it was creating a lot of questions. You know, people, the one I was talking to, they were asking me more questions. And uh, we actually to study more so that I don't look a fool. I, I wanted to be able to answer all the questions. So I think that must have also encouraged my study of Christian science. Well, you really had a turning point as you were moving through your education when you had a trip to Boston. Tell us a little bit about how that impacted your career or your educational journey at this point. Well, yeah, first of all, it was a very big opportunity this is something, this was a big dream. To travel to the U.S. was really a very big opportunity for me and changed everything almost. Because I remember before traveling to the U.S., I had plans to join Principia College. I had actually tried to apply and the, the application process was going on well. When I reached in Boston, I remember I was seated in, in the mother church and then I was seated to this, next to this young lady called Meredith and she looked at my name tag and she said, are you from Uganda? I said, yes. She said, I think I know you. And I said, no way, you, you can't know me because I don't even have a relative in, in, in the US. How do you know me? Then that's when she told me that she had worked on my application. She was, I think, working as an intern. Mm -hmm. So she had seen my name and she said she worked on my application and had been actually admitted. So it was very exciting to know that the process was complete and had been admitted. But now when we were doing some of the sessions at the mother church, I came across the word CSO. They were discussing about CSOs and I was asking them, what was it? So they told me they were student organizations at colleges and universities and they talked about all what they do and it was very exciting so i wanted to know how do people create csos then they say even one individual even if you are one at your university you can actually start one and because i'd never heard about cso in my country i said i want to do this in my country so when i came back to uganda i decided to cancel my application to Principia and uh, applied to go to Makere University so that I can start a CSO there. Now, this was uh, when I shared this with my friend, Dr. Nancy, she wasn't about it because at Principia you had a scholarship and I actually had taken it for granted. I assumed that because she had helped, helped me in my last year, final year at the high school, she was automatically going to help me at the university, which wasn't the case. So, but I didn't, I wasn't so scared because, you know, almost all my entire education journey from primary 
through secondary, people were helping me, different people. God was using people to help me with my school. So I knew even here, God was going to use someone to help me go to this university. So I continued praying and, and, and believing that someone is going to help me pay for this school fees. And indeed, somebody came up. And this is how it happened. There was a student, a younger lady, who came to do research in Mackay University. I think somewhere they talked about me. And this lady, when she went back to the US, she discussed my story with her professor, a professor at MIT. This gentleman offered to pay for my entire tuition at the university without wow. even meeting me. He didn't even try to contact me, to talk to me. He just offered to pay for my tuition. Mm -hmm. Now I had to look for where to get uh, my accommodation and meals. So that's how I came up with an idea of selling newspapers. So you had your school taken care of, right? Yes. But yet you still had to find a way to live. You had to make a living, right? So I, I can see how your entrepreneurial spirit began to thrive and flourish, right? Yeah, and, and, and it was so natural because I don't remember really trying hard, but it, everything was just working out so naturally. So I came up with this idea of selling newspapers to professors at the university and some students who can afford them. I could wake up in the morning, pick the papers from the suppliers, and then slide the papers under the doors of the homes of the professors mm -hmm. so that by the time they wake up, their papers is there, right there. And I had this policy. I was not asking for money right there. I waited until the end of the month and then give them a bill or an invoice. And the professors really loved it so much. And I worked like that for about three years in my entire university. Now, I also wanted to share with you that when I visited the US, I met many, many friends. I made many friends from all over the world, people from different countries in Africa, from Asia, from, from Canada, from everywhere. And they were all great people. And among these people whom I met and I made friends with, there was a special person called David Maxwell, who was a student at the University of Texas. He's currently working with Texas Instruments. And he came to visit me in Uganda the following year in 1999. And he brought me my first computer. Oh, wow. This was so exciting because, you know, I'd never even used a computer. Now, to get one of my own was a big thing. I remember before he came to, to bring me a computer, we used mm -hmm. to just write through post office. It could take a month for my letter to reach and another month to receive his response until when Dr. Nancy allowed me to use her personal email address she could allow me to type in her computer, in her email inbox. And uh, yeah, that's how we used to communicate. David brought me a computer and it was so exciting. And I taught myself how to use the computer. And time came and I said, can I do something more with this mm -hmm. computer? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's how I came up with an idea of typing my coursework. School coursework. How many people had a computer? No one. There was no other student who had a computer. Ah. So I was the first one mm -hmm. to have a computer in my class, at least. So when I submitted in my work to the professor, he was so happy and actually ordered all the students to type their work because he said, I can't read your handwriting. Most of you write really so badly. So I want to type your work, coursework like Lamek did. So they ran to different secretaries nearby or around the campus and pay for their work to be typed. But that was a big challenge because, you know, the secretaries didn't know how to keep the, the time, you know, the deadlines, but mm -hmm. also they never knew how to correct the mistakes the students were making. Right. So most of the work had a lot of mistakes. So this made me to think about another opportunity of typing students' work using my computer. So I went around telling students, my friends and my fellow students, that look here, 
I can type your work. So I opened up a small shop outside the campus and I called in people to come bring their coursework to type. I remember typing my first work I was getting from students. They all sat there, I, I put their bench, they sat there in front of me and just stared at me. And I never, I never really enjoyed it. I never enjoyed being stared at. So I came up with an idea of bringing in Christian science literature because I had a lot of sentinels and, 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 and journals at home. So I brought them in so that students could keep themselves busy studying this as I'm typing their work. But it didn't work because now every student who was reading Christian science literature, there was asking me questions. So instead of typing, I was busy answering their questions. And so I had to hire someone now to type their work as I explained to them Christian science. And that is how the Christian science reading room started. So time came when a lot of students were bringing in their work and I said, but now how can I also attract other students? who are not bringing in their work. Mm -hmm. And that's when I got an idea of opening up another section in, in, in the reading room. So I created another alternative library and I went around the university calling in students to come to this alternative library. Because you know, in the university library, there were less books and there were many students. If you wanted a book, then you had to book for about maybe a week in advance. So I was, telling these students that here there is another alternative library which where you can actually get a, a book without lining up, without having to book a week in advance. So a lot of students came for these textbooks, but now they were seeing this Christian science literature and they were asking questions. And, and I was always busy talking to students. Uh, so then, you know, it was exciting to see all these people coming and filling up the entire reading room. And then I said, but these are only students. How do I attract in other, other people who are not students? And that's how I came up with an idea of bringing in a telephone booth. There was very few people who had mobile phones. And even telephone booths were not very common. You had to go downtown to find one. So bringing it to your community was a big thing. And many people were so happy to, to see this telephone booth. And they used to come in and then to use a phone, but then they see a lot of people reading and they were like, what is going on here? They come in and then we talk to them. And the time came when it was always very full and it brought in people from all walks of life to come and discuss Christian science. Well, it's just amazing, Lamek, to, to hear you and your enthusiasm and your spirit and see how you were so willing to share and, and so unafraid. This shy, bashful little boy from the village has turned into this incredibly gregarious, spirited, inspiring businessman while you're going to school. It's really amazing. And then to see how that blessing transformed your life. Tell us a little bit more. So let's, so let's move forward into graduation time. So you've graduated now and you've got a, a thriving business. So what happens then? Actually, before graduation, there is even something which I did more because there were now many students who were being exposed to Christian science. And uh, I was even inviting them to church. Some of them did actually become church members. I also decided to start a CSO in, in my university. Mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. it wasn't even so easy, but uh, yes, with all the knowledge I was getting on a daily basis, I was able to overcome all the challenges. I remember, for example, someone asking, ah, what is Christian science? It was actually one of the professors and said, when, you know, when you are trying to register a, a, a student organization, you have to go through all the managerial and the administration. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, and they were asking me where well, this wasn't a, a, a cult. And this one professor asked me, how many are you? How many are you in church? And I said, we are 
20 to 30. And he said, you see, that is a crowd. You, you can't be uh, only 20 people in charge. And I said, sir, I don't think that is that qualifies us to be a crowd because uh, if you are saying we are crowd because we are few, then it means even the big churches were once a crowd because there is no big church which started big. They all started small. I knew a cult was something which controls your thinking. And the Christian science was actually the opposite because we don't even have a preacher. So you read on your own and discover things on your own, which is actually the exact opposite of a cult. So when I explained to this to, to the professor, he, he allowed me to register. And I, was act, I even shared actually with one of the Catholic dean of mm -hmm. students. He gave us a permission to meet in one of the Catholic uh, student center. So, yeah. And also what I did before graduation is I did some research because I knew that I discovered that there was a lot of ignorance about peace and science on the campus. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to do something which could help people understand more what peace and science is. So in my final research or thesis, I decided to research or to write about why there is an increased number of people moving from the mainstream region, joining the newly introduced church like Christian science. So I made sure that in my literature review, I quoted something from Science and Health. And now I knew professors were going to, to wonder where this, to find this book. So I made sure I placed a copy in all departmental libraries of the university and also in the main library. So that when they see my quotation or citation, they at least know where to get the book. This actually worked out because this research is one of the projects I passed very well. So when I graduated, <clears throat> my business was running up where the secretarial bureau had turned into a computer teaching institute or center. I had made friends with people who had graduated in computer science. So I persuaded them to come and teach computer because I bought many other computers and placed them in, in the reading room to, to type people's work. But then I was wondering, what do we do with the computers in holidays? So that's how I came with an idea of teaching computer science to students in holidays. And what is interesting, even those who are studying computer science at the university could come and practice because at the university, there were a few computers and the students were many. So sometimes, some students were not getting a chance to get hands-on, you know, practicals. So they came to my business to come and practice what they were learning at the university. So the business was moving on well, and they decided to add another business there because I really didn't have. Yes, I started a, a taxi. And so you, needed, uh, you needed something else to do because you weren't busy enough. Started the CSO, mm -hmm. doing a research project, running a business, sharing your faith. Not enough, not enough going on, right? <laughs> like, I kept on thinking, what can I do more? What yeah, can I do more? Why not? Yeah. So the idea of the taxi came up, and, uh, and, and, and because I loved driving, so this could give me a chance to drive. And uh, yes, the taxi business also has started and it was moving on well. But this is also the time when the mother church learned about my approach, my new approach of mixing the reading room with other businesses. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they felt that was a good mode of doing business or, or exposing, you know, bringing the, the reading room to the people instead right. of waiting for people to come to the reading room. Mm -hmm. They decided to appoint me as the international coordinator for the sales of science and health in East Africa. And this was so exciting for me. And uh, I decided to do a book launch at, uh, at the reading room. And uh, I remember hiring tents and the uh, hiring entertainers, people were beating drums. And then I, I invited all the media houses in Uganda to come and be present when you are doing a book launch. And actually, one of the, the, the newspaper called Bukede, the local newspaper, yeah, made this, they covered us. 
And yeah, it was a big thing. And the mother church wanted me to go outside Uganda, share and train other people on how to sell or share science and heresy. I remember putting in a lot of books in my taxi car and then drive off without even knowing where the exact route to go to Kenya or Tanzania. But this helped me because I remember driving to any city, any city and then stop and ask for directions, but also ask for where, whether there is a bookstore and then talk about science and health. I was praying for protection in all of this. You are driving to a new country, you don't even know the road, the directions. So you had to really rely more on God, God's protection. And I remember one time I was driving to Mwanza, the first time I drove to Tanzania, and we, I was driving through a national park and I found a roadblock. There were soldiers and they said, you can't drive there because it's dangerous. But then I told them I'd driven a very long distance from home and I was nearing my destination, so I couldn't stop there. So they were so nice. I talked to them nicely and I shared with them about science and, and science and health. And I even gave them two free copies of science and health. So they were so happy and they gave me an escort, a, a policeman with a gun to drive with me through the park. And this man, we went on talking, discussing about all the good ideas I was discovering in science. And he was so much uh, interested. So when we reached in Mwanza, he said, I'm going to help you even look for a safer hotel. And he actually went ahead and looked for me, booked for me a nice hotel where I started making now contacts to, to the Christian scientists in, in Mwanza. I called the, the number which I found in the Christian Science Journal, but it wasn't working. I decided to write to them an email and I checked they were not answering my email. I stayed for two days and I wrote about three different emails and they were not responding. So I decided to leave Mwanza and then continue to Nairobi in another country, Kenya. So when I asked about the direction to Nairobi, they showed me it was actually on the opposite direction of where I was staying. So I decided to, to change my hotel and go stay in the direction, find another hotel. So that's what I did. And as I was driving, looking for a hotel, I saw a signpost of a hotel. And I said, okay, I'm going to stay in this one. I kept on following the signposts and it was leading me off the road. And this is not what I wanted to do really because I wanted to be on the main road, but the signs were taking me to the deeper, deeper inside. But anyway, I decided to book in. And when I, after checking in into a new hotel, I went back and wrote another email from the internet cafe, telling them, the Christian scientists in Mwanza, that I've changed my hotel from the first one to now a new one. This is when they also checked the email. They checked the email, and what was very interesting is the new hotel where I had checked in was just separating walls, perimeter walls with the church in Mwanza, San Science Church. So they came running to my hotel and they said, how did you discover us? How did you know that we are staying here? I said, where? They, said, they showed me the church and I couldn't believe. So I knew it was now God's work. And it, this it charged me more. I felt like a, a brand new battery. I, I felt now I have more reason now to do what I was doing and I, because I knew God was on my side. And so that was a very experience for me during this work for science and here, setting science and here is to, in, in East Africa. You know, what's interesting, Lama, because I'm often asked about how do I get experience and how do I learn about this and how do I learn about that? And we're always talking about volunteering. If you can't find something to get paid, are you willing to work to learn? Are you willing to give back? Are you willing to volunteer so that in, in that place that you want to ultimately get to, are you willing to do that? Your willingness to jump in, because I know you have your businesses back home that are helping support you, that this activity was really from the goodness of your heart, right? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really very interesting. I think my passion to do volunteer work is just natural because I did many other things on voluntary basis. After, after working for the mother church, I also worked with the principal foundation, which is found in Kansas City. They had a program in Uganda called the Uganda Project, and they were helping kids in both primary and secondary with tuition. And mm-hmm. I was their facilitator. I was doing voluntary work as a volunteer. When I finished that, that's how, that's, that is how actually ABF also contacted me, made contacts with me, and Through I volunteered. Principal? Yes. Yeah, through that work? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. The Albert Baker Fund wanted to expand to Africa. They contacted me towards the end of 2003, mm-hmm. but we really started working in 2004. And I volunteered to work as a representative of ABF in Africa for five years. They hired me in 2009. So volunteering is no problem with me. The main force which drives me is the fact that I was helped in almost my entire education journey. People helped me in my primary school. People helped me in my secondary school, even at the university. So I decided, I promised myself that if I start working and earning something, I'm going to do the same. I'm going to be helping people to access it. So when ABF came in and contacted me, I was very happy because I knew it was going to help me achieve my dream, fulfill my dream of helping people access education without actually much struggle. Uh, Because originally I was thinking I was going to make money and then pay it myself from my pocket. But now ABF is here wanting to pay for students just with my support. Mm -hmm. So that, that pushed me to work for all those years as a volunteer. But you see what is interesting, even after being hired, in 2009, I still didn't give up. I started all, I continued doing volunteer work with other mm-hmm. organizations. Right. For example, I volunteer, I still volunteer with Asante Africa Foundation, a nonprofit organization which helps students in, in primary and secondary in Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. I'm also serving on the board of the, an international school called Three. Rivers Academy in Kenya. I'm also serving on the board of uh, uh, a vocational training institute in my village, in my, my home area called the Single Vocational Institute. Mm-hmm. And I'm also a board member on Chamoringa Primary School. So I'm doing all this on a voluntary basis, even when I have a paying job. So to me, anything which has to do with education, that is my person. And I'm always I always just do it without even thinking. Yes. Well, tell us a little bit about what you do with the Albert Baker Fund. With Albert Baker Fund, I'm working as the African program managers. And we have operations or, or our program is in 13 countries in Africa. We do work with universities, good universities in every country to provide assistance, financial assistance, to those practicing active Christian scientists who are struggling to find tuition. And my role is to actually verify. I work with a team of in-country representatives together with an African processing agent to verify that the information given to us by the students and the universities is genuine. Once we verify and confirm that the information is okay, then we pay for those students. But also my other work is to mentor these students. So that is my role with ABF. And I'll tell you, I'm so happy and to have this opportunity to work with the Albert Baker Fund because it has exposed me to many interesting things. For example, I think uh, I'm really so blessed. I feel so privileged privileged to witness transformation of people and and also to witness 
the kind of huge impact made by these students they do on their communities in their countries and Africa as a whole. Well, let's talk about this one in particular because this, this is one of those organizations that you work with and volunteer, and they came to you with a particular help need that involved a, a hiring process. So tell us how that worked well, out. I happened to sit on the advisory board of the Three Rivers Academy in Kenya, a, a new international school sponsored by E3 Schools, an organization in the U.S., so I was contacted to be amongst the panelists, the people who are going to interview and hire the, the new principal of this international school. I was so happy when during the interview to discover that the top, some of the top uh, candidates were actually our former ABF students and they were PhD PhD holders. So I was forced to dig more for information. I wanted to go back and see, to learn more about these two specific students. And that's when I discovered that they were actually originally foreman teachers in their local schools. And uh, when ABS expanded to Africa, people thought that it was only for regular students. But I remember when I traveled to these countries and, and told people that ABF is not for only regular students. It's only, it is also for other old students who had stopped going to school a long time ago. So I encouraged people that even if you stopped going to school a long time ago, but now you feel there is a, a special skill which you can earn and change your life or help you to transform other people's lives. You are welcome to apply to ABF. So this is how they apply. And they came to do advanced diplomas in education. After that, they also came back to do degrees, bachelor's degree in education. And then they came back to do master's in, in, in education management. And then they didn't stop there. They came back again to do PhDs. So, these two ladies are now working in two different universities. One is working as a senior manager of the university, and another one is teaching, is a trainer, is a lecturer in a national teacher's college. To me, this was so much gratifying to witness the kind of impact, huge impact the ABF is making it, you know, to these countries and what the, 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 I mean, to these students and what these students are also passing forward to their communities. Well, it doesn't and, stop there. This beautiful young lady is also <laughs> one of those ABF recipients. You mentioned earlier about helping your local community and the school. So tell us about how you and your sweet bride, Joy, jumped in and, uh, really made an impact? Well, because, because, you know, I really enjoy doing volunteer work and giving back to the community, passing forward the blessing. And uh, usually for me, anything which I enjoy, I want to share it. I try to interest other people to do the same, to do voluntary work, to, do, to give back to the community. And uh, recently I was working with my wife. This is my wife, Joy. And uh, I was working with her and I, to persuade her other big team of professionals to go to my village and help the two schools which are there. And so Joy and her team, she, we managed to do uh, a master plan for these two schools. She's and an architect, he, right? He, yes, mm -hmm. she does architect and, industri and inter interior designing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we did all this work for free. And you know, this, this is a big team of professionals, engineers, and, and they all did this work for free because I convinced them to do this because other people were already doing it. I had participated in, in a competition at Airtel. Airtel is a big company, airphone, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, telephone company in Uganda. And they were, every year they invite proposals <laughs> 
or, right. of organizations or mm-hmm. uh, individuals. Over a thousand, making... right? Over a thousand, yes. a thousand proposals yes, came in. This and... company uh-huh. has over 11 million subscribers. So when they send out anything, many people respond. So this competition were over, I think there were above, uh, over a thousand submissions. And they called me, I remember I was even in Nigeria doing ABF work. So I received a call from, from Airtel and they said, are you Lamek? I said, yes. Did you participate? I said, yes. And they said, you have won. We are happy to tell you we have won. Your school has won and we are going to give you the windows and the doors to your school. So I was using this experience and, and, and the incidents to explain to other professionals that look here, you can do this as a social corporate responsibility. And we have been able to achieve a lot because of this initiative. Yeah, a lot of people now I know are jumping to this volunteer business. Well, you you obviously made a huge impact. And and that again is in your your local community. You've really just such a wonderful example, Lamek, of how mentoring and reaching out and being unafraid to, to share the things that you're learning and what you know has just been such a blessing to you and your community. We're gonna go right to the Q&A at this point. So Lamek, how has casting your net on the right side and, and how has it been to be so fearless in casting your net on the right side impacted your life and your journey? Well, I would say it has impacted almost my entire life in many ways. For example, I've always learned, I've learned never to give up. I, I learned this again by studying Christian science because this was the motto of Mary Baker Eddy, the founder of Christian science. And I've learned never to give up. I don't give up easily. And even when I, I try something and doesn't seem to go the way I, I intended it, I don't take it as a really failure. I've learned to move with things and know that this is God's plan. So I don't really see, see it as a failure. And I've also learned how to seek for protection, I, to trust God for protections. I take my life. I look at God's love as, a, you know, I always compare it with the way wax protects the car from the dust. So if you have complete confidence in, in, in the truth which you learn, you, you will know that you, you can't be affected by any harm. So we are always protected. And I've applied this in my entire life. I'll give you an example, a small example. When I was growing up, I used every time I'm moving at night through the forest, going home to the main road, they used to tell us that you move with a stick, a reed, it protects you. I don't know how that was true, but it, what is interesting that even when I had a stick, I was always very scared until when I was exposed to Christian science, then I knew that actually our protection comes from God. And that is when I started moving without fear. So that has been actually, that's a big change from the way you used to see things. So knowing that you are always protected by God is, is, is very, very important in my work. Even when I travel to countries where I don't know anybody, we keep expanding. ABF keeps expanding to other new countries and I'm always the first person to visit. And usually I go to a country when I don't know anybody, but I'm always very confident that God is going to protect me, is going to show me the right people to talk to. And that has worked for me very well. So uh, we have a question and the question is, maybe share an experience or some challenges that you faced during your voluntary work. Sometimes I actually see when when I'm faced with challenge, Sometimes I celebrate. It's weird. It's weird because uh, people are always, they are disturbed when they are faced with challenges. But to me, every time I have a challenge and uh, I see it as an opportunity for me to, 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 to pray and apply Christian science. And every time I solve a problem or a challenge, I celebrate. 
I'm like, yes, I know this one. So it is always a, for me a celebration. So I don't really see it as a challenge. It's an opportunity for me to celebrate again after solving this. Lamek, you, you've been so wonderful and so generous with your willingness to share your thoughts and your journey. It's, it's a remarkable journey. I can't wait to, to share it with those who weren't able to join us today. If you're interested in helping to improve Africa and the lives of Africans, you can go to the Albert Baker Fund website and you'll find wonderful information there. And if you're a student in Africa, I know we've had some that re have reached out. Be sure that you check the website and there's lots of information right there. And Lamek and his team will be happy to help you. If you're interested in North American programs, you can check the website as well for that. And if you are interested in the Career Alliance and connecting with folks like Lamek, our career allies are looking for jobs or looking to connect with one another, go to the abfcareeralliance.org. If you're a student or you know a student, be sure and, and share with them about our Brotherly Love Scholarships. We are accepting applications for those. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And remember to cast your net on the right side. We have a stellar example of one who has done that and is doing it. And I can't wait to hear the new stories. And I can't wait to do Lamek and Robin number two down the road so we can pick up some of the things that we didn't get to talk about today, Lamek. <laughs> yes, you're right. <laughs> sure. Well, it was a terrific time and you're so, so gracious for staying up so late in your neck of the woods with, with those sweet babies there close, I'm sure, by the side. And until... We meet again, my friend, and all of you that are out there. Thank you for joining us today. In two weeks, we'll be back with a focus on human resources and how we approach and move through this time with all things that are new. It'll be an exciting show with Beth Trevino. She's the HR director at Principia College. Lamek, love you, man. Thanks so much. Thank Appreciate you so much. You. It's been a pleasure. Look forward to seeing you soon. All right. Bye-bye and greetings to everyone. You too, brother.